Well, welcome. My name is Sean, and I am the Online Gathering Pastor. Wherever you are listening in from today, you are welcome. You know, at Calvary Church, we're excited to be on mission to catalyze an epic release of Jesus apprentices who are connecting to Christ, to community, and to their calling. And if you live in the central PA region, we want to let you know about a couple of things that are coming up at Calvary Harvest Fields. The first one is a congregational meeting on Sunday, November 12th. It'll be happening at 4 o'clock p.m. in the youth room. We're going to be voting on our 2024 budget, so members are highly encouraged to attend, but all are welcome. The second thing we want to let you know about is a blue Christmas service on Sunday, December 3rd at 6.30 p.m. So let me ask you, are you grieving a loss? Because there's no time limit on grief, and we know that grieving can shape the holiday season differently. So whether it's the loss of a loved one, loss of a job or a relationship or some other circumstance, we want to share with you a special Christmas service focused on reflection, honoring memories, and moving towards hope and healing. So if that's you, or if you know someone who is grieving, we encourage you to attend or to invite them or offer to attend with them. We also want to give you an opportunity to practice generosity through your giving. The Bible says that where your treasure is, there your heart is also. So with all that God has given you, whether it's little or much, we want to encourage you to live a life of generosity. The easiest way to give is through the Calvary app. And we just want to say thank you for being part of all that God is doing through His church as you are faithful and obedient to giving. Well, coming up shortly, Scott will be continuing our Gritty Blessings teaching series, and later we'll be celebrating communion together. If you need to grab some elements, we encourage you to go ahead and do that right now. But before we spend a little time in worship, I just wanna pray over our time together. God, thanks for your incredible love for us. And Father, as we look at what it, what it looks like to have a purity of heart, I pray that you would open up our minds and our hearts to all that you have for us. Holy Spirit, work in and through each of us, even right now, especially as we respond to you with our worship. For it's in your great name we pray, amen.
What fuels our next step when the journey is daunting, facing seemingly insurmountable odds? When failure has been our companion, why do some choose grit when others quit? The capacity for grit is what the writers of Scripture called endurance or perseverance. Perseverance is the shape of a heart that's increasingly able to honour its commitments, live out its calling, and rise above the hard to reach the hope. Some call it grit, some resilience, Whatever you call it, it's simply the shape of a heart that refuses to quit hoping that God's best is yet to come. It's the grit in your soul that finds traction for blessing in the most difficult circumstances. And there is a pathway to these gritty blessings that will lead to a resilient life. Jesus once shared them in a mountaintop moment. Eight Steps to Building a Resilient Life Hello, Calvary Church. It's great to be spending some time with you today. My name's Scott. I'm one of the pastors here at Calvary and uh, have an opportunity to kind of jump back into the current sermon series that we're in that's called Gritty Blessings. Uh, In this series, we're looking at part of Jesus's most famous sermon called the Sermon on the Mount, and we have a specific focus on what's commonly known as the Beatitudes. We believe that these Beatitudes give us a kind of road map to a truly blessed life. The steps that Jesus gives us here uh, to follow towards this blessed life are very different, completely different from the steps that the world would tell us to take. Jesus is saying things and teaching things like, Blessed are the poor in spirit, blessed are those who mourn, blessed are the meek, blessed are the hungry. Uh, These will never be the steps that the world puts forward to achieve a blessed life, but these are the steps that Jesus tells us we need to follow if we want to really experience a kingdom-based blessed life. 
So today we're going to be looking at the sixth beatitude. Uh, if you missed any of the previous ones, I would definitely encourage you to take some time, check out our YouTube channel, listen to those. Uh, I've been thoroughly enjoying this series. I hope you have too, and, and it's definitely worth taking a few minutes to go back and catch any of the ones that you've missed. Now, it may not look like it at first glance. We're going to kind of read uh, some verses here in Matthew in just a minute. But it may not seem like it at first glance, but this focus on the heart, purity of heart, is so important to the life that Jesus is calling each one of us to live. But let's take a minute and read uh, Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 through 8. And it says this, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Now before we kind of get into exactly what being uh, pure in heart looks like, what it entails, uh, you know, everything that kind of goes into that. I want to just share a story about, uh, I guess, kind of the motivations of the heart. So I'm 42 years old. We're going to we're gonna go back uh, a few years, a couple decades, I guess, at this point. I graduated high school in 1999. I was part of uh, the youth leadership team um, of, of the church that I was in it's called Grace Covenant Church uh, back in Lewistown. So during my time in high school, uh, part of this ministry team, I continued to actually help serve in the youth ministry even after graduation. Jorn was actually uh, one of the youth pastors. Pastor Jorn was actually one of the youth pastors I had whenever I was younger. And he kind of had it on his heart to put together this student-led, kind of youth-led ministry team that was a part of uh, what was going on in the youth ministry of the church. And so I graduated Way to high school, uh, felt like God was calling me um, into ministry, and I wanted to be involved with it as much as I could, so I kind of stayed on and continued to help um, with the youth ministry after graduating. So maybe around two years uh, after graduating from uh, what was at the time Indian Valley High School, may still be called that, Indian Valley High School over in Mifflin County, uh, a prayer meeting for students got started in the school. So it was kind of meeting, I think, one morning a week uh, or every other week, something like that. And, and students were getting together to pray, but we were also able to go in and join them uh, during the prayer time. So I decided to join those who were leading it and kind of lend my voice uh, to those who were coming together to pray. I'm not 100%, um, but I don't think I missed very many, if any, uh, of these prayer meetings. And so once the school year ended, we got through summer break and we headed into the new school year. The prayer group, I think, was looking to get started again. And I found myself suddenly struggling in my commitment to continue uh, joining the group. So I had been there faithfully, kind of week in, week out, week in, week out, praying with the students. And then all of a sudden, I just I, I couldn't commit. I didn't want to get up that early, didn't want to go in, all these types of things. So, you know, as I was thinking about it, I was like, what changed? What, what led from that level of commitment to I could hardly make it to one? And what changed was that Thea Whitford, who had been faithfully attending the prayer group as well, had graduated. I had been biding my time for her to graduate high school and, and kind of graduate out of our youth group so that we could begin dating. We had a hard and fast rule at the time that youth leaders were not allowed to date youth group members, which I will just say, excellent rule to have in place. But once she graduated and once she kind of aged out of the youth ministry, all of a sudden we were able to start dating. And once that happened, my passion for prayer suddenly began to wane. On the outside, it looked like I was an inspiring leader trying to lead the youth into this movement of prayer, but really my heart was in it for all the wrong reasons. The only reason why I was showing up for prayer every morning of that prayer meeting was because I wanted to see Thea. I wanted to hang out with Thea. I knew she was going to be there. We'd have a chance to interact. Once she graduated, I was gone. So outward appearance... I was doing all the right things. Outward appearance, I was leading by example. Outward appearance, I was doing the things that was expected of a youth leader to do. I was encouraging the students, all those types of things. But inwardly, at the heart level, I was in it for the wrong reasons. 
And uh, just just so that you know, it did not escape Jorn's notice, and uh, he was very gracious to point out to me uh, uh, this kind of lack of integrity on my part. But we all we have a strong, not just me, we, and I think maybe it's maybe it's a, a specifically a Western culture thing, a, a United States things, kind of a modern Western deal. But we all have this strong propensity to be overly influenced by what we see outwardly. Perhaps without even realizing it, we just kind of understand that in the society that we're living in, we're being judged by what others see, we're judging others by what we see. It's why we put so much effort into maintaining a certain appearance. Our our modern Western culture is way more focused on outward actions, and, and I'll add on to that correct understanding, knowledge, education, we're may, way more focused on those things. Proper actions and accurate knowledge take precedent. If what you are doing seems to be good, and it's perceived that you have the right knowledge, education, expertise, then often you're just kind of given the benefit of the doubt. It's assumed that you're as just as you appear. You're a good guy, a good lady. Jesus' teaching here is throwing that system uh, out the window. Christ's primary concern is our hearts. That's his primary concern. He's letting the crowd know as he's giving this message, as he's teaching his disciples, he's letting them know, and and he's letting each one of us know that what matters to God is a pure heart, not, you know, quote unquote, correct actions or proper understanding. In fact, we're going to see just how worthless actions and knowledge are when they're not flowing out of a heart that is pure. That's the focus that Jesus is going to be zeroing in on. And what's super interesting, you know, as he's, as he's talking, you know, to this crowd and, and all throughout his ministry, he interacts with a lot of different people, not just his disciples, you know, not even just kind of the crowds that show up, but, but one of the contingent, one of the percentage of people that would seem to always be in the crowd were kind of the religious rulers, right? The scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the, the people who really knew, um, knew the religion, New scripture, had studied the Bible. And over and over and over again, Jesus, when he's confronting uh, these people, he's always confronting this idea that their actions aren't lining up with their heart. Their knowledge is, is only head knowledge. It hasn't actually gotten down to heart level. It's not changing the way that they live, the way that they approach God, the way that they love and serve other people. Over and over and over again, all throughout his ministry, Jesus is pointing back towards the heart. What he's interested in is the heart. Now, when we talk about having a pure heart, we can easily find ourselves floating back to a place where all we're really looking at is our actions. It's so simple. um, It's so kind of ingrained inside of us that a lot of times we don't even realize that we're doing it. You start trying to think about your own life or you start trying to think about even the life of somebody else, whether it's a a friend, family member, somebody that you know, or even somebody that you're kind of aware of. Maybe it's somebody that you like to listen to, you know, podcast wise or uh, on the radio or you listen to their sermons on YouTube or whatever the case may be. It doesn't even have to necessarily be a Christian person, but when you kind of consider people, if you really pay attention, you're going to find that your mind so often often gravitates to outward appearance, actions. What does it look like? What kind of person does it look like they are based on the way that they're living their life? And again and again and again, Jesus is saying it's all about the heart. Stop looking at the outward appearance. Look at the heart. Something that is interesting and sobering about Jesus' Sermon on the Mount is that it ends with an illustration of two houses, If you've been in the church for any length of time, you've heard about this. If you've spent any time reading the the New Testament, you've heard this. It's really common, popular story. But if you haven't, that's all right, because the two houses, one is built on the sand and the other is built on the rock. And Jesus says, when the storms of life come, when the storms come, the house on the sand collapses and the house on the rock stands. Because the foundation of sand is not able to withstand the storms while the foundation of the house built on the rock is able to withstand. But what's really interesting, and again, what's convicting, what's sobering about this picture is the houses themselves, from what we can kind of see in in Jesus' sermon from the story, the houses themselves seem to look identical. 
to simply look at the external qualities of the houses that Jesus is talking about, you would look at them and you would say that they were both built with equal quality. They both look fine. But it's what's underneath. It's the foundation that sets them apart. See, Jesus taught his disciples to pray, fast, tithe, practice generosity. But you know, the Pharisees did all of those things as well. All the things that Jesus is teaching us to do as those who are seeking to be apprentices of Christ, the Pharisees were doing all of those things. That's why they were so honored and respected among the people. But Jesus is telling us and telling them, his hearers even that day, that the most important issue is the status of our hearts. It's not about what's going on on the outside. The outside can be deceiving. Again, over and over, Jesus, when he confronted the Pharisees, he says, listen, you're, you're outwardly, you're doing all the right stuff, but inwardly, you're completely missing the mark. I mean, these are the guys who, who had dedicated their lives to studying the Word of God, and then when God showed up in the flesh, they missed Him. They, they couldn't even see Him. They couldn't recognize that this was the one they were speaking with. This was the one they were debating. This is the one that they ended up crucifying. Outwardly, they had it all. Inwardly, they'd completely missed the mark. So what does a pure heart consist of? I think, I think this is what it consists of. It's quality of heart as well as quantity of passion. So let's start off by talking about quality of heart. Let me start this off by reading to you Matthew uh, chapter 23, verses 25 through 28. And this is... Um, one of the exchanges that Jesus is having with the Pharisees, kind of, a, I, I just mentioned this earlier, this happens over and over and over again throughout his ministry, uh, and so this is one of them. So again, Matthew chapter 23, uh, starting in verse 25, says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You clean the outside of the cup and dish, but inside they are full of greed and self-indulgence. Blind Pharisee, first clean the inside of the cup and dish, and then the outside also will be clean. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to be people as righteous. You appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I bet you if you polled most people, maybe even inside the church and outside the church, one of the number one things that people would say they don't like, drives them nuts, rubs them the wrong way, whatever you want to say, is, is a hypocrite. Hypocrisy. Nobody wants to be known as a hypocrite. And when we focus only on the external, when we focus on actions, when we focus just on understanding, and we're not focusing on the inward, we're not focusing on the heart, we're not focusing on obedience, we're not focusing on purifying ourselves, we're going to become hypocrites. We're going to be in danger of our lives skewing in the direction of the Pharisees. Jesus is addressing when the inside, our heart, doesn't match the outside, our actions. When talking about quality of heart, we're talking about things like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We're talking about forgiveness and mercy and grace like Pastor Dan was talking about last week. These are the characteristics present in a heart that is being purified from the dross of the world. These are the characteristics of the heart of God, the heart of Christ, and they will be present in us as we allow him to purify our hearts. And how do we purify our hearts? This is the pathway of the Beatitudes that we've been talking about throughout this whole series. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Recognize the poverty, our poverty of spirit, our brokenness. Mourn over our sin and weep for what's important to the heart of God. Submit our strength. Blessed are the meek. Submit our strength to God and bring our will under his will. Hunger and thirst for righteousness and empty ourselves 
of worldly things that deter that hunger, that fill us up with things that aren't really from God, empty ourselves of those things and practice mercy. As we reach out to coworkers, as we move out in love to family members, neighbors, people in our community, as God asks us to love those who are hard to love, to show mercy and, and forgiveness and grace towards those who've hurt us, as we choose to follow him, the example of Christ, the pathway of the Beatitudes, our hearts will become purified. The dross will float up to the surface. God, through the Holy Spirit, will skim that stuff off. And it is a process. It's lifelong. This isn't something that happens when we first receive Christ. This isn't something that happens after a few weeks of following him. This is a purifying of us that happens degree by degree. This is the no quit grit aspect of what we're talking about, the aspect of this beatitude, because the purifying process is just that. It's a process. And it's easy for us sometimes to get frustrated that things aren't moving along faster. But that's just us. I don't think it's God. He's not frustrated. As we change degree by degree, as we allow him to slowly do the work of purifying our hearts, we get frustrated sometimes that we're not moving along leaps and bounds. You know, that I'm not 50 degrees further down the road next month as I was this month. But, but God, this is how he's designed it to work. Degree by degree, it's a slow process. It's a slow process of us submitting ourselves daily, sometimes multiple times a day, choosing to submit our will to his, choosing to show mercy when we don't want to, choosing to mourn over our sin and see it for as ugly as it really is. And it's day in and day out. As we do that, that purifying work, and we can get fatigued, frustrated that this isn't happening faster. And that's why we have to have that no-quit grit that Pastor Dan's been talking about. We have to stick with it and recognize this is a lifelong process. It's not even just a lifelong, just a race. Like, hey, just get to the finish line. It's, it's just building our relationship with God, interacting with Him, interacting with other people inside and outside the church, and knowing that all of that together, God's using all of it to do this purifying work in our hearts. And as we allow Him to do it, the quality of our hearts, the purity of our hearts will slowly, degree by degree, become like that precious gold after the dross is just taken off over and over and over again. But it's not just about quality of heart. It's also about quantity of passion. An aspect of having a pure heart is also found in the idea of an undivided heart, a heart whose affection is set completely on Christ rather than being fractured by multiple affections. We can see an example of this kind of undivided affection in the words of Paul in Philippians 3, chapter 3, verses 9 through 7. And I want to take a minute, 9 through 7, 7 through 9, but I want to take a minute and uh, read this to you. Paul says this, But whatever, whatever were gains to me, and he had a lot of gains. If you look in the verses, we're not going to take the time to do that right now. But if you look at the preceding verses, he's like, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. I was a Pharisee. I was, I was passionate. He has all these things that were kind of listed to his credit, things that were gains for him as far as outward action and maybe even self-righteousness, the way that other people saw him and perceived him. But then he goes on in verse 7 to say, But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. And listen to this, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. Compared to Christ, Paul considered everything else as garbage. Now, when you really think about that, there's no boasting about throwing away trash. It's what you do with trash. 
Nobody brags about throwing away their dirty tissues rather than holding them close to their chest. It's like, well, of course you throw trash in the trash can. You take garbage and you put it outside. That's what you do. So Paul's affection for Jesus was so great, his estimation of Christ's worth so high that all the other stuff he could have clung to, that he could have placed his affections on or in, were thrown away. And not thrown away, it doesn't even sound like, oh, it was, it was so hard to let go of this thing. Again, nobody has a hard time letting go of garbage. If we want to have hearts that are pure, we need to have Jesus as the focal point of our heart's passion. Another interesting and convicting place to see how this plays out is throughout the Old Testament story, specifically of the various kings that come through and serve in Israel and Judah. We see kings who had no passion for God, and they just allowed a flood of idolatry to come into the land, and they ended up leading the whole nation astray from God. But then there was all these kings who had a divided passion, and they often got rid of the most like egregious idolatry, but they always allowed some to stay. They always allowed some degree of idolatry to persist. And then there were the very few so devoted to God whose affections were undivided that they removed everything, every idolatry, every piece of of, uh, worship of another God, of anything outside of, of God, it was gone from the land. They just got rid of all of it. It begs the question, right, of where do we land? Where do I land? Where do you land? Here's a video from Kate talking about how God worked in her life to move her towards undivided affection for God. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Hi, I'm Kate, and this is my gritty blessing story. I have been a soccer player my entire life. Um, Pretty much the first thing I can remember is kicking the ball around with my dad in the backyard. Um, So ever since I was a little kid, um, you know, being a professional soccer player was something that I dreamed about. Coming into college, um, senior year of high school, I pretty much, um, from an earthly perspective, had had everything going for me. Um, Was a pretty highly ranked recruit, was super successful um, in my high school career. Um, And then in the middle of a game, I felt this pop in my knee that as a soccer player, no one ever wants to hear. And that was kind of the start of God really putting my dreams on pause um, to show me that he was the most important thing in my life. That first injury, I tore my ACL, um, was out for about a year, uh, and then came in my freshman year at Penn State, healthy, ready to rock and roll, um, and a couple games into my freshman season, um, I had the same, same season ending knee injury. It was pretty jarring, like, soccer was such a huge part of my life, um, and it was my whole lifestyle revolved around around playing. Um, And so to not have that in my life, I definitely felt um, pretty lost. Um, I felt like I had just lost this huge piece of my identity um, and was struggling a little bit to to find what my purpose was if it wasn't kicking a ball around on a field. Um, And so I kind of felt myself asking God like, well, now what do you want me to do? The way that I was living and the way that it was acting, it was pretty clear that soccer was my first priority um, and God was just kind of this thing that I talked about on Sundays, um, went to church and that was the end of my relationship with him. Um, And so through the injuries, he was really showing me that, hey, I need to be your first priority. I care more about your heart than I do about your circumstances. Um, And so he was willing to take the success that I had been experiencing away um, so that he could have my entire heart, Um, not just a piece of it on Sundays, not just a piece of it when I decided to open my Bible, but my whole heart, 100% of who I was. Being in those dark places um, really has kind of given me the confidence that no matter what I'm facing moving forward, I know that God's got my back through all of it, um, and He's with me through every single moment. When I fully 
committed myself um, to loving God and being in relationship with Him, um, I was able to show the people around me so much more clearly uh, the love of Jesus um, and who He was. Um, and so I think that that was the biggest blessing um, that I got out of it, just this feeling of, of fulfillment um, in, in knowing God more deeply and more intimately and be able, being able to show that love uh, to the people around me in a way that I hadn't really thought of before. God really does work. Um, he really is at work in our lives. Um, and if you trust Him, if you lean into Him, uh, I promise you're gonna be okay. Are we allowing ourselves to be content with hearts that have some affection for God rather than undivided affection for God? And then the promise of this beatitude is that blessed are the pure in heart for they will see God. That's the promise. We get to see God. As we follow the path shown by Jesus in the Beatitudes, we'll find our hearts, minds, and eyes far more open and attuned to what God is doing in us, through us, and around us. We're told in 2 Chronicles 16.9 that God's eyes range throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully His. The more we seek clean, uh, the more we seek to clean out our hearts of all that is worldly and sinful, and the more we seek to set the full passions of our hearts on Christ alone, the more clearly we'll see His worth and beauty. The more clearly we see Jesus, the more passionately we'll want Him. It's as if the impurities of our heart and our fractured affections play the role of cataracts covering our spiritual eyes. The more we're willing to remove them, the more clearly we'll see the beauty and glory of God. So how can we be intentional about continuing to purify our hearts, maintain the won't quit grit, rather than allowing ourselves to settle out of either fatigue or frustration? How can we recognize where there's still work to be done in our hearts? First thing I would say is pay attention to your words. In Luke chapter 6, verse 45, we're told that the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Pay attention to what comes out of your mouth when you're angry, frustrated, annoyed, or you're feeling like you've been hurt. How do you respond? What do you say? Our mouths will often show us the areas of our hearts where God wants to do some work. But we can get really good at using the right words, right? only saying the religious things or the things that people expect. So it can't just be that. Another area to pay attention is what gets your time. This is something that I know Pastor Dan has talked about before, but it's something that we need to be reminded of. Jesus doesn't have our hearts if he doesn't get our time. It would be hard to make the claim that Jesus is our chief passion if we're regularly able to go through a week, a whole week, while barely giving him any thought or any time. The third thing I would say is just ask him. You know, this has kind of popped into my head as I was working on this message. Sometimes thinking about next steps, uh, we can begin to think about God like an inanimate object, like he's a puzzle box, like, hey, we just have to figure out how to kind of crack this thing open and, and get into the heart of it, rather than realizing that he's a relational being who wants to interact with us. So if you're not sure what aspect of your heart he's wanting to go after, Take some time, get quiet, and ask Him. This pathway laid out in the Beatitudes is how we, as the church, as the body of Christ, begin to actually look and live like Jesus. And as we purify our hearts and see God more and more, we'll be able to reflect to those around us the beauty of the God that we see. Let me take a minute to pray. Father, thank you so much that you are pursuing our hearts. Thank you for the purity and the passion of your heart. And God, we thank you that you move towards us in love over and over and over again. Lord, help us to come before you. Help us to come with ears willing to listen and hearts willing to respond. And we ask, help us to purify our hearts. And we ask it in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Now we're going to be heading into a time of 
communion. So as the worship continues, just encourage you at home to, to find some kind of bread, crack or something, some kind of juice or something that you can drink and, and just take a minute celebrating communion, celebrating the, the purity of the heart of Christ as he submitted even his life to death on the cross to the will of the Father. His love for God and his love for you and I as he hung on the cross, knowing that his death was going to bring us life. God bless.
Thank you, ladies, for that time of communion, reflection, and worship. And thank you to Scott for our great message today on the condition of our hearts and what it looks like to be pure at heart. You may have heard Scott say something like this. He said, purity of heart is far more important in the eyes of Jesus than right actions or correct thinking. He said the outward aspects of our lives are meant to flow from the inward reality of what's happening inside our hearts. So let me ask you, where do you need to lean into this right now? What areas of your life do you need to let go of so that you can go all in for Jesus? Well, it was so great to be with you again today. If you have any questions about anything from today, or if you just want to pray with someone, we encourage you, please reach out to us. Well, that's all for today. We look forward to seeing you next time. Jesus.
Jesus.